Good morning. The Apostle Peter, in chapter 3 of his first letter, and in verse 15, tells us that Christians have hope in them. He speaks of the hope that is in you. And so last Lord's Day, we began to consider the hope that is in us, but in a a somewhat drawn-out study, uh, because not everyone feels that hope or fully perceives that hope, and many people struggle with anxiety and depression, which seem so opposite to hope. And so we began last week to consider anxiety and depression with the goal and the intent of arriving at the hope that is in us as that great remedy and medicine that we need and that is available to all of God's people. And I want to briefly review a little bit from last week's sermon because it it has an important foundation for us that we need to keep in view and keep in mind as we continue into today's sermon. And that foundation was a reminder that God has made man body and soul. God has made man body and soul, and that we need to keep both of these in view when we consider anxiety and depression. Because we will quickly find that as was mentioned last week, the terminology anxiety and depression is used in different ways with relation to the body and with relation to the soul. And it's this confusion that often creates conflict and misunderstanding between people where one person speaks of anxiety and depression and what they mean by that is fear and sadness of the soul And another person speaks of anxiety and depression, and what they mean is a a paralysis or a numbness of the body. Not that we want to divorce these things or separate them or push them away from each other, but we, as in body and soul, but we do want to distinguish uh, between those two things and develop a careful way of speaking that would allow us to communicate what we are experiencing so that others can help us and so that we can be understood. So let me give you an illustration to just firm up perhaps and repeat that distinction between anxiety and depression as it would be in the body or in the soul. Consider with me for a moment uh, what we what we often refer to as postpartum depression. Postpartum depression. The word itself postpartum means after giving birth, postpartum. And When a woman gives birth to a baby, for nine months, her body has been changing drastically. And when she gives birth to the baby, her body changes again drastically and very rapidly. Her body during the the process of giving birth and after giving birth, so many things are happening and changing in her body and quickly, things that are intense and things that are rapid. And there are some women who experience, after giving birth, they experience what we call postpartum depression. You hear that word, depression. Depression after giving birth to the baby. So if if a woman has given birth and then she has depression, is this woman sad that she has had a baby? No, she's not sad that she has had her baby. Well, then why is she depressed? Well, because sometimes postpartum depression is really about her body and that her body, as it's processing many changes and trying to adjust and recover from this ordeal of of pregnancy, she, she in some senses may feel nothing or may not feel some of the ordinary experiences and feelings that many other mothers would and so she may not feel that same joy about the baby or connection to the baby that many others would feel if a new mom doesn't have the same joy or the same emotional attachment to her baby that other moms do does that mean she doesn't love her baby of course not she loves the baby 
but her body is recovering from the ordeal of carrying and birthing a child. And she'll get there. She'll get there. But if you think that postpartum depression just means that a mom is inexplicably sad or unloving, then you'll probably put guilt on her and say, why aren't you happy? Don't you love your baby? But we're body and soul, and she is happy, and she does love the baby, but her body is recovering, and she needs time to be able to process that and feel and express the ordinary emotions of motherhood. Now, you can see how if you think that postpartum depression is just a disorder of the soul, you'll say, come on, we should, we should rejoice and give thanks, and we should. But you'll, you'll try to move the soul when the reality is, to a large degree, what's happening is happening in her body. And it's just a matter of patience and helping her body to recover that one ought to. That is the, the direction that we should give our efforts to such a mother. Now, one of the things we said last week was when someone experiences anxiety or depression, that doesn't just excuse us of all responsibility, does it? And so also, a mother who's experiencing postpartum depression, does she just not care for the baby at all, or not feed the baby, or not, not raise the newborn? No, of course, she, she still has to do the things that relate to caring for the, for the baby. It just means that as she does this, her body is a stormy, turbulent sea of feelings and emotions and all kinds of things that in time will smooth and will settle. So that's an illustration to show us body, soul, differences, as well as the terminology of depression and what you think they mean by depression determines how you respond to it. And we have to be careful and take these things into account. Well, last week, then we started to look at traps that we need to avoid when we think about anxiety and depression or when we experience anxiety and depression because Christians have physical anxiety and depression. Christians have soul anxiety and depression, and we need to avoid certain traps. And we looked at four of those last week, and we're going to continue with those today. I had prepared seven more for today with a normal sermon manuscript length, but in Spanish we only got through three out of the four, so we'll only cover three out of, or excuse me, three out of the seven, so this morning we'll only cover three out of those seven, and so on and so forth. So this morning we're looking at three traps to avoid as we consider anxiety and depression of body and soul, which continues from the four we looked at last week and will continue on after that. Number one, the first trap that must be avoided when dealing with anxiety and depression is unguided children. Unguided children. Last week, we noted that many conflicts or disagreements about anxiety and depression tend to be very generational. An older generation not understanding a younger generation or younger generation resisting the counsel of an older generation, conflicts and miscommunications. And we said that this is partly due to insufficient vocabulary. However, another one of the causes is unguided children. Now, what do I mean by that? Unguided children. Well, there is a very strange irony that uh, takes place whenever an older generation criticizes a younger generation. And that strange irony is that it is the parents launching the criticisms, but it is the parents of that generation who in large part bear great responsibility for what they are criticizing. Imagine a baker who makes bad cakes and <laughs> complains about the quality of her own cakes. She makes a whole batch of cakes and just says, oh, the cakes today are terrible. I'd say, you made those. Imagine a carpenter who makes some chairs and he says, these chairs can't support any weight. You'd say, you know you made those chairs, right? You're just criticizing yourself. And it's the case to a large degree that in these generational conflicts and disagreements about anxiety and depression, there needs to be a serious reckoning and realization on the part of 
older generations of our own failures that have created in some part and in large part many of the things that the younger generation is experiencing. Now is this a, it's all their fault or it's all their fault? No, it's going to be both and ultimately when someone sins or does something wrong, they bear the ultimate blame for it. But there can be contributing factors and causes that bring about these scenarios and these situations. And so there's this strange irony if the older gener if an older generation says about a younger generation, well kids now are just this way. Who raised them? Whose chairs are these? Whose cakes are these? Who made these things? Who raised these? The younger generation would say, this is just a huge self-own. <laughs> the older generation is just owning itself when criticizing the younger generation to a degree. Now, the scriptures, the Proverbs of the Bible are full of warnings to parents that if they neglect to instruct and correct and discipline their children, then they should not be surprised when their children are arrogant fools without self-control. And so if parents today say, children are arrogant fools without self-control, I'm going to say, I wonder how that happened. The Proverbs are full of these warnings. Spare the rod, spoil the child. The younger generation that struggles to do basic things and seems overwhelmed by the mere fact that they exist and the harsh realities of life, for many of them, their anxiety and depression stems from a neglect in their parents who did not prepare them for ordinary, real life. So we need to be careful as parents not to fall into the trap of failing to guide and raise and parent our children. In other words, we need to teach them basic life skills. Teach your children basic life skills. Don't create burdens for them. Gradually include them in carrying the burdens of a normal life. When you're young, many things seem impossible because you don't have the experience of actually doing them. And so what we need to do as parents is not just tell them to do this, we need to take them through it and show them how it is to be done. Even if we know it is so simple and easy, and we know they can do it, it is still helpful for the parent to take them through it for the first time and show them and teach them how to do those basic things. And then it adds up. It gradually increases so that they know how to do more and more things because they've been shown how to do more and more things. But if you don't teach them life skills and you think, well, uh, I'll teach them when they go to college or something, it'll be too late. And then when they're of college age and they don't have basic life skills, then yes, the most simplest of tax tasks will seem overwhelming to them and they will have anxiety about writing a check or, or mailing something or applying for a job or, or doing their taxes or some of the normal, ordinary things of life or making a phone call, and then all of that anxiety can lead to, to depression. If the older generation says, ah, kids can't do anything these days, I'm going to say, did you teach them to do those things? You see, when a 10-year-old seems overwhelmed by something simple, we say, well, let's teach them now. But if you don't teach that 10-year-old, then that 10-year-old encounter is now in a 20-year-old in their experience, when they should have encountered this long ago. So parents in the house and the household chores, we need to give them responsibilities. And we need to say, come cook this with me, or come clean this with me, or come fix this with me, or come do this with me. And you include them, you show them. So you don't say, hmm, I'm going to come up with a job and give it to them so they know what hard work is. No, you say, there's work to be done in this home. I will show them and teach them and include them in the normal work of the home so that when they have their own home, they've done all that work and they can do it themselves. But kids these days say, oh, adulting is so hard. And it's not excusable, but it's understandable because for many of them, they are unguided children. And we say, if the older, older generation says, where does the anxiety and depression come from in people about the most basic life skills? Did you teach them the most basic of life skills? Another way in which children are unguided and therefore struggle with anxiety and depression is that they're not corrected and they're not disciplined. We must correct 
and discipline our children. Correction and instruction are just two sides of the same thing. Instruction is positive. Correction is negative. If you say do that, that's instructive. If you say don't do that, that's corrective, but it's also instructive. Okay, I know now not to do that, and I should do this. We need to instruct and correct and discipline our children. We need to, our children need to know that they can come to us and talk to us about how they are feeling or what they are thinking, and we should listen to them. However, as their parents, while we should acknowledge what they are thinking and what they are feeling, in that, and we should acknowledge that they really think that and they really feel that, and it's a reality to them, we also as parents at times, with patience and understanding, need to say to them, you shouldn't feel that, or you shouldn't think that. That's not quite right, or that's not, or that is wrong. Sometimes we need to say to them, you shouldn't be angry. You need to change your attitude. And so parents need to parent their children's hearts so that the children learn from an early age, I need to self-regulate my thoughts and I need to self-regulate my feelings. I shouldn't think that. I shouldn't feel that. If you let children raise themselves, they're not going to self-regulate. They're not going to self-correct. They're going to just give full vent to everything that they think and they feel. And so if you don't correct and discipline children, they will grow up into adults that cannot correct their own thoughts and feelings. And again, they become overwhelmed and anxious by anything because they're not prepared to help themselves, to self-soothe like a baby learns. By correcting their feelings or their thoughts, we are guiding them into maturing mentally and emotionally. Another thing that we need to do is to take away their pacifiers and expose them to the real world. We need to take away their pacifiers and expose them to the real world. Now, parents, listen carefully to this and listen humbly to this. Many young people struggle to face reality because so much of their reality is mediated to them through screens. Much of their time, much of what they see, much of what they are exposed to is mediated to them through screens, which means they're constantly exposed to a virtual and mediated reality. And in this virtual and mediated reality of screens, tablets and phones and TVs, everything is going to be carefully crafted and controlled and designed to entertain and to please and keep one's attention. And children are profoundly impacted by this. Parents, your child is not just especially entertained by a screen. You know, a little baby, a little child, you'll say, oh, they love this, this toy. Not talking about screens. You say, this one toy just fascinates them and they love it and it really helps them to play quietly. You say, that's great. They, you know, with some rattle or some toy, they love it and they, they play with it a lot. Parents tend to think the same way about screens. Well, they just love it so much and it helps them to play quietly. Those two things are not the same. The screen is exposing the child to so many stimuli. They are not just loving their favorite toy. Their brains are overwhelmed beyond the possibility of resistance. They cannot possibly look away. It's heroin for the brain, for a little child. And they're being captivated by virtual reality. The sights and the sounds that are assaulting their little developing brains cannot possibly be resisted. They're captivated and captured. And parents today rely heavily on phones and tablets to pacify their children. Well, what happens when you take away the pacifier? They face a reality that is far less interesting, far less entertaining, far less neutral, far more threatening, far more difficult than the screens that they have been watching for hours upon hours of their lives for years. And parents, this may be hard to hear, and it will, be, it will not be easy to reverse. 
But parents of young children, you must take away your child's phone or their tablet and teach them to sit quietly and patiently on their own without such irresistible stimuli. And you must think about this. The very first steps, the very beginning steps of maturation, self-control, and development are some of the earliest steps are sitting still, sitting quietly, sitting contentedly. If you skip the very first step of self-control through, through screens, if you use screens to completely skip the first step of hu human self-control, of sitting quietly and contentedly, what is that child going to be like if you fast forward 10, 15, 20 years? If they didn't learn how to walk, essentially, in their brains, if they didn't learn how to do some, the most basic of self-regulation and self-control, and then later we blame them for struggling to sit still, we say, why can't these younger kids, why can't they sit still on their own? Why can't they sit quietly on their own? You blame the children. So much of the blame, where does it belong? On we, who have beamed into their faces irresistible stimuli. It's hard to hear because it's hard to take away. Will we blame them when they struggle to sit still or listen with sustained attention and say that the younger generation is just so frustrating? We are bakers criticizing our own cakes. We're carpenters criticizing our own chairs. And for parents of older children, you must be very careful in controlling and limiting your child's screen time. This isn't about technology. It's about guiding our children into maturity and adulthood. And it's about realizing the effects of screens on this process. Think about communication. Children need to develop and progress in expression and communication. If your child could communicate fluidly through simplified texting and emojis and mean, memes, but they struggle to have a normal conversation or express their thoughts and feelings out loud in words, then they need to grow beyond the limiting factor of their phone. And their phone's not going to help them. Now, you might be thinking, I thought this sermon was about anxiety and depression. It is. Do you not see the connection between screen time and stimuli and anxiety and depression in younger generations? It's, it's as clear as day now. In years past, everyone smoked cigarettes all day, every day, and it was socially acceptable and, and common and not really thought of as a particular harm to our health. And we know now that such use of, of of cigarettes is destructive to health. And we look back and we think, oh, how could they do that? There's no excuse anymore for screen time. It's destructive and harmful, especially to little children and parents. There's no more excuses. There was a time when we didn't know the effects that this would have on our children, but now we know, and there's no looking away. And much of their anxiety and depression is because they live in a virtual reality and they're struggling to come to grips with the real world that threatens them, and it's not designed to entertain them, and that you have to sweat to eat bread, and that this world is cursed, and it's not just always giving them pleasure and enjoyment and distraction all the time. If you, if you neglect these things, if you neglect teaching them basic skills, if you neglect to teach them basic self-control, if you neglect to teach them basic communication, and then you criticize them for being anxious and depressed as they enter their, their adult years, they are unguided children, and we must bear the blame. And children, if your parents take away your screens, they have every freedom to do that. Screens are not a right that you have. They're a privilege if your parents give them to you. Do not resist, do not disobey. From the heart, obey your parents if they say no to screen time. You do not deserve these things. It is not a right that you have. It is something that your parents may give to you in, in their own judgment and their own wisdom, and you must not resist them. But parents, do not fall into the trap. It's a trap because it's so easy, but it makes them sit so still. They can't resist it. Hard drugs will do the same thing to them. I would never do that. You are doing the equivalent with screen time. If older generations wonder why the younger generations are so anxious and depressed, 
They only need to look at themselves and how they have not properly parented them. For a time we were ignorant, but we are no longer ignorant, and parents have no excuses now. Secondly, unfriendly friends. Unfriendly friends. Some people struggle to grow beyond depression and anxiety because of the people that they choose to be with and the people they surround themselves with. A true friend will tell you the truth even if you don't like it. And if they won't do that, they aren't truly your friend. We need friends who will help us, not hinder us. Proverbs chapter 27, verses 5 and 6 Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Open rebuke is good. The wounds of a friend are faithful, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. What does this mean? Judas kissed Jesus. (laughs) Sure wasn't his friend, was he? There's a contrast between an outward perception and a reality. The outward perception is they're telling me something I don't like. This friend is telling me the truth. This friend is confronting me with open rebuke and it hurts me. That's the perceived external appearance. But the reality is they're faithful to you. They're presenting you with what is good and what is right and what is best for you. And so when that friend wounds you, it's not to wound you, it's to help you. And they are being your true friend and they are faithful. Whereas the enemy, outwardly, how does it appear? Kisses and affection and, and sweetness. But the reality is, it's deceit. They're not helping you. They're harming you. Unfriendly friends. Think with me in terms of social media where technology like the internet through phones and tablets and computers and all kinds of things, the social networks connect people in digital spaces. So you join a Facebook group, now you are in a digital space of people collected around one group. Or you follow certain accounts on Instagram or other social media, now you are in a community, now you are in a group of people united around some central thing. A great deal of social media, especially targeting women, is geared towards dealing with mental health. Now, that's good, mental health. To promote health of the mind, there is much good advice and much advancement that has gone forward in the name of mental health. However, there are traps. There are pitfalls that one must avoid when dealing with mental health communities in social networks. Because these these communities tend to become a mutually reinforcing community that does not seek to overcome anxiety and depression, but simply affirms and applauds one another for living that way, and they all stay that way. And hand in hand with this, the second thing as it does is it quietly promotes a self-centeredness, which provokes and perpetuates the problem, because that's all you're ever thinking about and talking about and hearing about in this community is each person's own anxiety and depression. Growing up, my dad would joke with us as kids. He would say, do not think about pink polka-dotted elephants. And he would say, are you thinking about it? And we'd say, no, you you can't help but think about it when someone tells you that. Of course, he's joking with us. If people want to grow out of and, and get past anxiety and depression, but they surround themselves with a community of friends who only ever affirm and applaud each other with kisses with, oh, you poor thing, all the time, if that's all you do is surround yourself with people who are mutually going to reinforce your anxiety and depression, you're in a trap. In the name of a good thing, in the name of mental health, that's not a bad thing. I'm not saying all all things about mental health or mental health advice, all that's bad. No. I'm saying in mental health communities, there is a trap of people who simply mutually reinforce one another and are not being true friends to one another. Now, a true friend will be patient, sympathetic, kind, helpful, but sometimes a friend also does that which is perceived as hurtful, which in reality is helpful, where they say, 
come on, you need to get out of the house. <laughs> you know, let's go out. Come with me. I'll, I'm with you. I'm here with you. Let's go. Come on, let's do something. Some people need to be directed outside of themselves, but mental health communities constantly ref refer you to yourself. Some people need to look away from themselves and look out a window. They need to get up and go out and do something and be removed from constantly looking and thinking, looking at themselves and thinking about themselves. It's a trap which we must avoid. And if we have true friends, they will help us. Who do not, they acknowledge our situation and they don't say, oh, come on, get up, it's nothing. No, they'd say, I, I'm so sorry for you, I understand. Let me help you. Let me help you. Let's get past this. Let's get beyond this. They help you mature and grow. And you know what this means? Teens, if your parents are telling you the truth and teaching you healthy and mature ways to live, and you think they're just being mean to you, and you think your friends are so nice because they affirm you in your situation, they're not your true friends, and your parents are the ones who truly love you. Who's the true friend? Your parent, who wants you to grow stronger and be successful. Or is it the one who says, let's be children forever? You see? The third trap, and this will be our last one. We've seen unguided children. We parents have to take responsibility for our neglect and our poor choices. Number two, we've seen unfriendly friends surrounding ourselves in communities that don't help us to escape or get out, but rather affirm us and tra trap us. Thirdly, unending misery. Unending misery. Now you might think, <laughs> unending misery is a pretty obvious trap for, for anxiety and depression, but what, what am I talking about? Well, the dangers of screen time are not just for children. They're for all of us. And we need to be reminded that social media, news on the TV, and internet articles are all designed to catch our attention and keep our attention. They're all designed to keep your eyes on the screen. But what is it that they flash before our eyes all day, every day? Social media, news, and internet articles. What is it that keeps the eyes on the screen? It's outrage. It's violence. It's disaster, it's scandal, it's fear. What happens when a man or a woman is forced to watch hours of misery every day? If someone says to you, well, this morning for breakfast I had Carl's Jr., and then for lunch I had Taco Bell, and then for dinner I had McDonald's, and I just feel awful, you'd say, it's pretty obvious why. Well, if someone says, I absorb quite a lot of content from social media, news, and internet articles, and I feel anxious and depressed, I'm going to say it's pretty obvious why. Everything has multiple causes, but this is one of them that we beam into our lives all kinds of unending misery, and we wonder why anxiety and depression follow us everywhere we go. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 25 It says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. Anxiety weighs us down, a good word makes us glad. Will you get good words from social media, from news and internet articles? What if you only expose yourself to anxiety? Your heart is weighed down, and it's not a mystery. It's very freeing to know that you don't need to know every horrible thing that happened in the world today. And you don't need to know every stupid thing that people posted today. You don't need to know it. Remove the cause and the effect disappears. Remove the insanity and stupidity of the world as a cause of anxiety and depression. In some part, that anxiety and depression disappears. It hurts when I do this. Don't do that. You can choose to unfollow accounts. You can choose to leave groups. You can choose to block and silence and all kinds of things to control the content that you see. I'm not saying throw away your phones, throw away your TVs, never look at internet articles. I'm saying 
begin to see more clearly the sources of information and exposure and stimuli in your life and analyze, do the, are these things promoting unending misery in my life? It's important that we know the things that go on in our own lives and our own communities. It's important that I know crime statistics about La Mirada or things in my area. That's important. And it's important that I know what goes on in my life and in your lives because we are united by a social network, namely the church. And so it's important. And so if we're in an elders meeting and someone's talking about struggles of a member or member family, I'm not going to say, oh, no, 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 can't handle that. I'm going to say, all right, I'm here for them. I'm in it for them. We're all in this together. But if someone says to me, oh, did you hear about the disaster across the world? That's when I'm going to say, I don't, I don't want to hear that. But it's reality. Yes, it is reality, but you don't need to know all of those things. <laughs> you just don't have to. And beaming them into your life is only going to provoke your soul. Sufficient unto each day is the evil thereof, said our Lord. And sufficient unto each person is the stress of their life. <laughs> I need to focus on the stresses and the difficulties of my life to accomplish the responsibilities that have been given to me. And I need to focus, and I can't look away from those things. And I can't shirk those responsibilities or just excuse and extract myself from the difficulties of life as a pastor of this church and as a father of my family. I can't, I can't turn those things off, and I shouldn't turn those things off. But I can turn off all kinds of misery that others would want to beam into my life, and we should do the same, brothers and sisters. Anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down, but a good word makes him glad. And you know, this ought to remind us of the beauty of the Lord's Day. And this is where we'll close. I said earlier, I said, what if all you ever hear are bad words? A good word makes a man glad. What if there's no good words in the social media or the, the news? We all know the news isn't news. It's a business that wants to promote fear and keep your attention. What if that's all you beam into your life all week? For the Christian, even though we should be more discerning in those influences we allow in our lives for six days, what a joy and what a relief it is that our God, who is infinitely wiser than us, has said, stop. I have sanctified a day for you. And I have commanded you to come together and to hear from my word. And in this, in this word, what do we hear? Do we hear good words that make the heart glad? Amen and absolutely. Because when we come into the church, this word declares to us that in the blood of Jesus Christ... Our sins are forgiven. When we come to church, we hear the word of, of someone outside of ourselves, from God. And God speaks to us, and it's not entertainment and twisted truths and things we don't know what to believe or what to trust or what to know. We, we listen to pure truth, holy truth, and the wonderful good news, the good words of the gospel. And the Lord tells us, he says, gather together, assemble yourselves on the first day of the week. I have set this day apart as holy for you, for your body and for your soul. And so the Christian, every seven days or every first day of the week, we receive such an injection and such a boost of good words to revive the soul and such a rest from all our labors to revive the body. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for the Lord's day. And it makes me feel such uh, sympathy. I don't know if that's the right word, but I feel so sorry for the unbeliever who neglects the Lord's day and knows nothing of it. What did they have seven days of misery, seven days of misery, seven days of misery. And the only thing that they can set their heart on to, to find some kind of joy in this world is football. But what if their team loses? Then they're... They're very unhappy. And what they've set their heart on has disappointed them. But that's all they have, that and alcohol and drugs. All they have is the screens. That's as good as it gets for them. But for us, we say, oh, 
oh, thank the Lord for the Lord's day. Thank the Lord for the good words that make my heart glad. Yes, I feel anxiety and I feel depression about such things, but the Lord gives me good words so that I can press on and serve him and fight and grow. Oh, thank the Lord for his good words. Now we have to pause and stop here, which the timing worked out well for, for this sermon too. I had four more traps, four more points, and then more after that. Uh, but we're not rushing, and I hope that these have been helpful to you as helping us better come to an understanding of some of the causes of anxiety and depression in body and soul, as well as the traps to avoid so that we can break some of these cycles and, and grow uh, as God's people. We need to guide our children. We need to acknowledge true friends, and we need to listen to good words best words being the truths, the beautiful truths of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us be glad in that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that the good words of your holy scriptures do indeed make us glad. And we thank you that you have sanctified a day for our bodies and our souls to be rested and refreshed. This is the best day of the week, a day in which we remember the mighty, the victorious, the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that that good word that makes us glad helps to realign our perspectives away from that unending misery that the world would send to us and that we often so willingly drink and swallow. Oh Lord, we pray that you would help us to be true friends to one another. Willing to give open rebuke, even if it may hurt, that ultimately it might heal. And we pray that we would be humble to receive those rebukes, to receive that true love from true friends. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would strengthen every parent here for the difficult work but the blessed work and the good work of guiding and raising and parenting our children. Help us to be diligent. Help us to raise them not only with the basic skills and knowledge that they need for a normal life, but also with those good words of the gospel that give them hope and give them eternal life forevermore. Oh Lord, give us joy in this and help us not to lose that joy, but to hold on to it every day. We pray this in Jesus' name.